This program was produced by the Chemical Heritage Foundation. Our mission is to collect, preserve, and make known the history of chemistry, chemical engineering, and related sciences and technologies. Business as an entrepreneur, maybe, maybe you like the business and uh, not the uh, not the praise. But uh, I think for me, it was it was always about uh, relationships and and doing the right thing. So I appreciate it, uh, Wayne. Uh, like uh, like many of you here, I've, I've been wondering for the last month since I was invited, and, and it's a tremendous honor for me to to be here after sitting out there for a dozen years uh, at these uh, talks. But I've been wondering as, uh, as well as why me at the Priestly Society? So um, being here at Chemical Heritage, I figured uh, let me do a little research on the history of, uh, of Joseph Priestley. Um, we all know Joseph Priestley discovered oxygen. It was a great advance in the early days of uh, chemistry. And I discovered gravity on a molecule. It wasn't a big surprise. It wasn't that much of an advance. So that, that can't be the reason. Uh, Priestley actually, besides his chemistry, he started a religion. He was a founder of uh, Unitarianism. Uh, I can barely pronounce it, but my, uh, I got kicked out of Hebrew school. <laughs> Priestley invented carbonation. I have a soda stream, I used it. Uh, Priestley lived in Pennsylvania. I did not know that. He lived his last 10 years in Pennsylvania, so I live in Pennsylvania, so it's appropriate for me to, to talk then. And uh, I, uh, Priestley was actually a good-looking guy, too. OK, so uh, entrepreneurship, entrepreneuring. I can only speak here as I've only done it once. Well, I did it a couple times that I'm not speaking about. but. This, this is one story. It's an individual story. It doesn't apply for everybody. There's a lot of people here who, uh, who are entrepreneurs and ha have done it uh, their way. But um, it's it, entrepreneuring, at first, it's all about starting out. You've got to start to do it. And uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, there's a lot of ground to cover, hard work to do it right. Maybe you get lucky, maybe not. But at the same time, you have a broad vision. You need to watch the details. Got to get the details right, or you uh, can fail right from the beginning. Uh, for me, it was the expression I'm using here, don't get lost in the weeds. You, you really have to separate because you're uh, in my case, I was started out alone. I'm doing all things. You're doing big picture. You're doing details. So you've got to got to keep them separate. Uh, as part of that, pick clear goals and stick to them. Uh, not at the expense of success or failure. I did some things in business that weren't my target areas. I did a little trading just just to uh, keep some income going. And also most important, and uh, not everybody may think of this, is keep it personal, because the business, the, uh, it, it's gonna be about you in, in so many ways, and you need to consider who are you, where are you, what do you wanna be doing? 
So uh, I, I set my goals. Uh, my first was never having to work for anybody else. I had worked for 20 years uh, uh, for three big chemical companies. And uh, I started out, I was still in my 40s. I had a lot of my uh, work life ahead of me. And I was not going to risk everything that I would wind up working for somebody else. This had to work, and I had to remain independent. Second, I, I had a family. My wife was working, and she, she had to quit her job. She was going to give me two or three years, and uh, I had to make it work within that time. Uh, I wasn't going to borrow money. I wasn't going to be dependent on others. Uh, no partners. <laughs> partners come with issues. <laughs> and other, other fun things. I'd actually started a business a few years earlier uh, with two partners. Uh, and maybe they looked a little like that, actually. But, uh, and there were issues, and the, the success of the business became compromised with, within the personalities. So this one was going to be uh, without partners. And most important, I wanted to have some fun in the business, not the drudgery of just uh, earning a living or doing things I didn't like to do. Uh, and I was going to do it my way. It was going to be, I was going to remain honest, uh, keep my integrity. And uh, that was part of the reason of putting my name on the building, uh, per se, is that I wanted to say, I'm committed to this, and you're getting all of me. So this isn't just some business where, you know, I, I go home at the end of the day and you don't have anybody to deal with or you don't know who you're dealing with. So it was all part about keeping it personal. So, um, another issue, as, as people say, don't go into a war without knowing how to exit. If you're starting a business, have an idea of how you're going to define success. Um, because you, you'll, the, the business takes off, it evolves, other things happen, you get caught up, you, you may lose sight of your goals. Well. Uh, my business is a success because it met my goals, period. Uh, doesn't matter how big it was or how much money I made, it met my goals, I consider it a success. Other measures of success, uh, the business is self-sustaining. We don't have to thank you to uh, table two, help self-sustain it, but no. The business, we don't have to get up in the morning and beat the bushes for business every day. It's, the business has a momentum. It continues to generate and grow. Um, a, a, a good indication was a number of years ago, we start a lot of our business comes from referrals. Then all of a sudden, we realize we're getting referrals. First of all, the people coming in for business, we don't know. And then we say, well, where, where'd you uh, come up with Richmond Chemical? And they give us a name, and we don't know them either. <laughs> so obviously, the business is working if it's not just friends and family giving you business. And we never got a lot of business from friends and family. Yeah, Wayne, <laughs> Wayne referred to that <laughs> already. And the other thing is, are you giving value to the people you're dealing with? So we frequently have the experience where, as I'll explain the business model, we have a client and a vendor as part of anything we do. And when we have meetings and go out for dinner, they're you know, literally fighting over the check. Not every time, unfortunately, I still. When they come back, when the guys come back with an expense uh, uh, report, I remind them of this. But frequently enough, Frequently enough that we know that people are getting value out of what we're doing for them and the relationship. So that's, that, that's a great sign. And, you know, maybe the most important one is happy employees. Smile table, too, please. <laughs> um, okay, so... The business is our, our homepage. The, the, the business is successful. Uh, 
how did we do it? Uh, I told you the goals and what we did, but... All right, 26, I, I always wanted to do that, just like TV and movie. So, we're, we're 26 years old. 26 years ago, uh, I was in a, uh, a big company managing non-core businesses, and it was very frustrating, probably dead-end job. It's, you know, if any of you have been in big companies, I hope you've been in core businesses, because uh, to get anywhere, I had to do almost everything myself. And it was even worse than that, because the staff functions didn't want to cooperate with non-core areas. So you were fighting with staff against core assets and everything. So it was extremely frustrating, but at the same time, I'm in a position in life where I've got two college tuitions, I have a wife who has a, a deadline and everything. So literally, it's a crossroad of life. Uh, you know, the fear of going out on your own versus the ambition of trying to, to do something. And this is a decision that uh, maybe I had uh, come close to making this decision a few years earlier or whatever, it didn't quite work, but many people face this decision and it's, it's tough. Uh, I know some contemporaries were uh, uh, out of a job and they started to fool around with the little things in between jobs and it developed into a business, but when I started, uh, a lot of people came up and not many people walked away from a salary to start this business. So it was a step, it was a leap, and I'm gonna stay away from this edge. Um, so at this point, I was committed to starting my own business, but as I said, um, I took stock. What do I have? As manager of the business, I didn't really have the customers uh, you know, there were sales people and everything. Uh, the technology, I, I had gone from one business area to another over a few years. They, they were kind of low-tech businesses anyway, so I, I had no uh, technology in my pocket that I could build a business on. Uh, no product, uh, I didn't know enough about the products we were selling. I knew a little bit about their manufacture and properties in use, but again, I was uh, a generalist on them. And, uh, you know, no money to go buy a business or whatever. So, taking stock of what, uh, I, oh, I'm sorry, I, I did have a supportive family. So, the, the family um, said, it's, it's now or never, and the kids in college say, don't worry, we'll, you know, if you can't pay for college, we'll figure something out, and et cetera, do it now. So, with that encouragement, I started. And I look back as, what can I do? Um, I did, I, I had a good, I felt, at least in my own mind, I had a good track record of problem solving. A lot of them were complex problems. I, I had spent you know, my entire time in multidiscipline environments, right? Even um, graduate school, my jobs as a uh, manager of non-core businesses, they were uh, different areas. So the, the disadvantage of having no products, technology, customers, markets, stuff like that, I turned into an advantage that I had an overview, I was a generalist, I could handle multidiscipline things. So, I decided I'm going to develop a business based on independent outsourcing. Actually, a name we came up with a couple years later, because the, the, the name didn't even exist then, at least not in the chemical industry. Uh, we called it custom manufacturing or toll manufacturing. Uh, people would, one chemical company would go to another and say, can you manufacture such and such? We don't have the capacity or whatever. And it was, it was before the industry even started. Informex and trade shows, it was kind of a backdoor business. The company I worked for had a little bit of that business. I was, uh, I was the manager of that. It was about 10% of my portfolio, but it was a, a fun part of it. And uh, 
It was now you have entire industries, CROs, CMOs. They, they didn't exist at the time or they weren't called that. Um, so it was, you know, me just looking for an opportunity. There were people who participated in this as consultants or manufacturers reps. Consultants uh, would get paid up front and, you know, do a few days or a few weeks for a company. And there were a couple who were successful. Uh, they advised me strongly against what I was going to do and suggested I guess I compete with them. But I didn't even have the base to start with that, and I was uncomfortable with the uh, not being able to build a business in, in a way, just going from job to job as a consultant didn't uh, match my goals. And manufacturer's rep, I went to my first... Uh, CPHI or something, and I walked around, and there were no manufacturers who wanted me to rep for them anyway, so it, it wasn't an option, and it, it really didn't fit what, what I, I wanted to do. So basically, I had no clients, and I had no manufacturers, and in, in starting the business, I would have to develop both of them simultaneously, essentially. So I invented independent outsourcing, which is... Uh, as you'll see, it's we get a project and then we will find a manufacturer to work with sort of as a partner. We don't start with a manufacturer like a manufacturer's rep, or we don't just work for the customer like a consultant. This was a, a different model. So uh, it speaks, speaks for itself. I call it a, a business about nothing because... It was, and those of you who remember Seinfeld had a, uh, a show about nothing that was also successful. I'm sure it met their goals. <laughs> so um, the business is about nothing means we don't, we're not in the business for specific products or markets or technology, which we didn't start with. We still really don't, don't have that. Um, again, we, we don't go by the consultant or manufacturer's rep model. Uh, and at the time, there were a lot of skeptics. I got a lot of good advice, which I ignored. And I got other good advice, which I followed. And uh, my background was I always leaned towards going back to the basics. I had my University of Chicago experience, it was always go to the basics. Go to earth, fire, and water, and you've got to... You've got to drive it on the blackboard before you're allowed to do anything. So, um, and um, in the early days, it was generate time over target was my expression. And I had now had a history of changing in the, the 20 years I wasn't working for myself. I was in about four or five different technology fields, different markets. And I was successful in each of them after a few years. And then for reasons beyond my control, I had a move or that I was moved into a, a different area. So I was confident if I could get time over target, it would work. So we started this with a long view. And I was fortunate and we had a couple trading opportunities come up. A, you know, a plant in Taiwan on methyl methacrylate went down and, you know, I... I had a backdoor source, and we, we sold that for a year, and it was, it was sufficient for that year. And then we had a couple projects that started to work. So the basics in, in the business. Um, from our point of view, it's, uh, it's a little difficult. We don't sell. We don't have any salespeople. Our company involves uh, our office staff and support and project managers. We, we have found that, uh, you know, we're delivering solutions and you, we can't sell this service to somebody who doesn't think he has a problem that needs a solution that day. So we don't spend our time on cold calls or general sales calls. We, we really spend our time on solving problems. Uh, another basic in our business is avoid, we're not customer centric, we're actually project centric, and that's because the customer is not always right. Of course, you want to listen to the customer, you want to understand what does the customer need, 
And frequently that's different than what the customer is asking for. And especially when it involves uh, synthesis of chemicals, the application of chemicals, you have to listen and you have to start to understand. And you can get a job once if you deliver what the customer asks for, but if it doesn't work. So we, we are very cognizant that the customer is not always right. Uh, quality manufacturers. When I started out, I had some friends in the industry, small manufacturers, uh, not Wayne for, for this example, but they, they turned out to be, they were lower cost manufacturers. They turned out to be marginal in performance. And uh, after the two or three years, my wife did quit her job. She came to work for me, worked for me for about 12 years. And she came in and she said, and one of the things she dealt with was uh, purchase orders, vendors, logistics. And so after a while, she came to me and she said, why are you dealing with these blanking people? They're no good. So why aren't you dealing with quality manufacturers? So, you know, we regrouped and we started and we found out that the companies that, you know, were... Uh, even, cost wasn't even an issue. When you do the job right, it's cost efficient. So, um, and it was also in the early days that some of the companies, uh, Eastman Chemical, when there was an Eastman Chemical, anybody remember them? So Eastman Chemical approached me and said, you know, we like what you're doing and we'd like you to bring us some projects and we'd like you to visit the plant. And I said, where? And it was in Batesville, Arkansas. So I said, that's a long drive and expensive plane fare. So they said, oh no, we'll fly you down. And so this was cool. They flew me down, they gave me, there were actually two of us. Paul Harris was, uh, it's, it started his business about six months later and was doing some similar things. They gave us a plant tour and they were selling us. And eventually I did bring a couple of projects to Eastman and they were, they were very loyal to, to, uh, to me in the business. And it was interesting to see that even large companies, even companies that had substantial business wanted to work for us. So that was in the, in the first few years of our business and it, and it changed our approach. Another thing for all occasions is perfect is the enemy of good, by which I mean in business, you have to meet time and cost calls. You have to do things. And even though you know you could do it a little better with more time or you're not ready, particularly an entrepreneur may want to get his thing perfect before he speaks to investors and everything. And you really can't afford to do that. There's always, there, if necessary, you can improve as you go along. But if it's good enough to start, you're far better starting. And in, in project management, we're aware of this, that it's not just the perfection of the thing, it's time has value too. All these uh, factors have to be evaluated. So a lot of people, and I know we deal with companies where the entrepreneur, the inventor starts out and he's pushed out for a business manager. The equity people, the investors bring in business people, you know, a lot because it's his baby and he wants to perfect it. So we, uh, you know, I can be a perfectionist as, as Dan who helped me prepare the slides will probably tell you, uh, but you have to be aware of, uh, of this rule. Uh, Deliver the cones, I, I have to give a, a little background here. My, my, my first job uh, was working for my father in the summers. He had a, a cone distribution business and I couldn't get any other jobs probably because of my Hebrew school record or whatever. But. <laughs> so it was, it was not the ice cream, unfortunately. And it was cones go to Dairy Queen and Carvel and everything. And it was a seasonal business, and it was a lot of deliveries. And uh, we would load the trucks in the morning. They'd go out, and the drivers would park the trucks at the warehouse. It was a long day. We'd come in the morning, back the trucks up, and open them up. And many times, there was cases of cones in the truck. I said, so my father pulling his hair out, saying, oh, they didn't deliver the cones. What's on? So 
It was, you know, no GPS, no Google or anything. There were mistakes in the addresses or they ran out of time. So I became aware of the problems of not completing the job. And then as soon as I was 16, I would take roots and everything. So it was fun. And I never came back with inventory. I'd stay out. I'd figure out a way. I'd call or whatever. So in our family and in our business, Delivering the cones means you've got to finish the job. Um, we don't, I think another factor in our success is, I don't micromanage, we don't micromanage. The, the project managers know their projects, they're closer to the people. Uh, and also our project managers handle the customer and the manufacturer. We don't divide into people who handle manufacturing, people handle customers. So they know the project best. And we're, we're there as a resource, we're there to help, we're there to uh, help solve problems, but we're not there to micromanage individual decisions. If, it's, if they make a mistake, they will be aware of it, and our people are incented uh, based on the success of what they do. And the learning curve is surprisingly uh, steep on that. And in this business, it's uh, relationships are truly the heart of the business. And this was, I, I'm, I'm happy that I was, I started out with this focus. I mean, I didn't have anything else to focus on, but that I stuck to it and it worked out because uh, the, the referrals and new business and repeat business comes from this. And it's the same as investing many millions of dollars in patented technology or unique manufacturing equipment, because this is, is something that, that goes on and on. Um, some people who, who aren't as immersed in the business models, we are wonder, well, you're a middleman, you're just a middleman. That's not a popular expression in, in, in our house, but uh, we truly add value on both sides of the equation. And some of this may not be as obvious uh, uh, to you as, as we've experienced. First of all, anybody who deals with us, nobody's paying any upfront costs. Nobody's doing an exclusive. So we're a free service to test out. We, uh, customers come to us, Manufacturers, again, come to us. Um, we don't ask for exclusive commitments. We work with a manufacturer. We don't tell them, oh, don't work with anybody else. Don't give us this. Uh, we're all performance-based. And for a client, they get access to our 26 years of relationships, our uh, manufacturing contacts and things like that. Uh, startup companies, early stage companies, companies in different industry, they could never get that kind of access. And we just don't find a manufacturer. Again, we're managing the project from beginning you know, through the life cycle. So we, and we manage, you know, probably a hundred projects a year over 20 years. We have a lot of experience. We know where projects uh, can get in trouble. So it, it's truly a value for both the client and the manufacturer. And uh, like we've noticed, you, you're in business long enough and all of a sudden the, the, the client, the people, especially in the bigger companies, the people are changing. And they change a, a couple of generations and they're calling us and asking us basic questions about their product and only we know it. <laughs> I mean, they've either shredded their files, they don't talk to the previous people. So if we weren't there, they wouldn't know basic things about their product, they wouldn't know how to manufacture it, they wouldn't know the quality issues, so we're the legacy. Well, that sort of fits chemical heritage and things, so maybe there's two reasons. An honest broker, so yeah, it's easy to claim to be honest, but by honest broker, I mean, in the early stages of projects, clients, uh, manufacturers have their own issues, their own points of view. And a lot of times there's a dance. You know, the manufacturer has concerns. He doesn't know whether they're going to go through with it. Cl uh, customer also has concerns about the manufacturer. So when we speak to each party, frankly, we 
some of these issues aren't fitting and we can counsel both sides and we have, we're like a marriage broker, we have done many projects where we're, we're convinced they never would have happened if, uh, if we weren't involved. And our rule is when you're out on a client manufacturer visit, never leave them alone in a room together because the project may blow up. So, so you, you cannot go to the, to the uh, take a bathroom break on your own. And uh, we act as a principal, so we're buying these services from manufacturers. When we bring in young companies, emerging tech companies, uh, the manufacturer starts on it. Uh, there's no barrier because they don't know who the customer is. Um, this, well, and it also our buying power gives us uh, more control. Frankly, it's much easier to manage the project when you're buying from the manufacturer and, and the manufacturer understands they're, they're working for us. And it's kind of a three-body problem. I mean, they're also working for the client. And uh, for the manufacturer, they, they view us as incremental income. We're, you know, we're never going to displace their regular products we're bringing in things that are essentially filling empty equipment or empty spots in their, in their uh, business. And actually, it, it works even more efficiently because manufacturers are constantly calling us and telling us, these are the openings we have. Can you fill it and whatever? And there's a lot of people in custom chemical manufacturing. There's some companies who do it a lot and advertise it and everything. There are other companies who don't want to advertise it, but they will call us and say, such and such is down, we have an opening for six or nine months. If you could find a drying project for us or distillation, it would be great. We don't want to tell the world we have an empty equipment. So we get a lot of opportunities that are, you know, it's an opaque business in many ways. And we work, it's not just win-win, it's win-win-win because it's three of us who have to win and, and that's the way we work it. So uh, marketing, again, I'm saying we're not recruiting, uh, we're, we're not making sales calls per se. So how do we get business? Uh, um, and also, you know, we're, we're not going to spend big bucks on advertising and things like that. So uh, we do the basic smart things. For a small company, we can, we can get pretty sophisticated on, uh, on some of the, the things we do. The, the idea is we want to have a presence where, you know, clients may need us once in a year or two or three year period. So the sales calls are never, you have to be lucky to get them on that day. We want to create an environment where when they have the need, they will think of us and call us. And that's our effort. And, you know, this was a campaign uh, on uh, Mrs. Chemical, as she was known in the business. Uh, this was a Chemical Week campaign that they did and it was free to us and it was very successful and obviously we've, we've saved the cards. So a lot of our smart marketing is the modern stuff, the, web, the website, uh, emailing, uh, networking functions, uh, trade shows, uh, articles. Uh, we do a lot of writing, we put up white papers, we get editors and people who, who want to use it. Uh, we take advantage of PR opportunities uh, wherever we can. Um, our, our website is, is extremely effective. I mean, I, I wake up in mornings and I say, thank God for the web, it's unbelievable. So, uh, we, uh, we have very good web statistics, and the inquiry rate is, is terrific. It's literally, uh, we get other inquiries from people we know are dealing with. This is just what comes through the web unsolicited from us. Some of the people we've met, and they go to the website. Not all of them are good projects, but that's what you've got to start working with. And, and our website traffic data is, is also, I'm told, very good for, uh, 
for a company like us. Half the people, uh, it's coming from searches, not ads. And 21% of our traffic is coming from people who type in Richmond Chemicals. So they know us, they're going to our website. Uh, we've always been uh, 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 very uh, focused on building up what, we don't have products or technology or any of the other things, but we do have a proprietary database. Uh, and we have uh, a few thousand manufacturers in the database, and we have uh, almost 10,000 customers and other people in the industry. And we use this for, you know, a e-blasting that I'm going to speak at the Priestly Society. So we got about a tenth of a percent response on that, but other times we do better. Uh, what is different about how we manage projects? Uh, the industry is, is mostly multi-step organic synthesis for, for life science companies and, and some chemical companies. A lot of the CROs, CMOs, are based around that. There's a real need. There is relatively high value. We're also doing a lot of inorganic synthesis. And that's a much more opaque part of the business because a lot of people don't know where to go for inorganic synthesis. And so we've developed a, a lot of nice business based on that. We do polymerizations, not a bulk a commodity, but specialty polymers, specialty applications. Um, we also do uh, unit operations. There's a need, somebody needs custom drying, custom grinding distillation, and that's uh, also a fairly opaque area. People don't know where to go. There's a lot of scheduling issues, a lot of logistic issues. And we combine our manufacturing side with uh, what we call specialty sourcing. People uh, will ask us for various intermediates, raw materials, and we, we search and find them. And it's obviously if if they can buy them easily, they're not going to come to us. Or if they come to us, we say, you know, come next month to the Bren Tag talk and you can buy from him. So we're, we're buying unique things. There may be one manufacturer in the world or, or whatever. And a lot of those inquiries turn into custom manufacturing because the existing sources can't do that. And we also can leverage it when we are doing custom synth synthesis for people we, we have. Uh, material sourcing that, that helps. Just a little examination of, of what our business looks like. Uh, half of it is specialty chemicals, um, synthetic fibers, water treatment, industrial applications. Uh, more than a quarter is life sciences and a, you know, a, a nice uh, slice for electronic applications. And of the, the total, 17% is emerging technology, new companies starting with new technology. So we think that's a very interesting share. And when we start early stage with them, the, the, those projects stick with us. They're, you know, they're not gonna build plants. It's, it's, uh, so that's been very good for us. Um, for, for this past year, we have 115 customers. Of those 115, 50 were new last year, and that's typical of every year. Our business, we grow, but we have to replace about 40% of our business just to stay even. And um, a little more than half our business is our 10 biggest customers, that's probably fairly common. And our, uh, our, big, uh, our major customers tend to be big companies, as opposed to where we're buying. Uh, a little less on the manufacturers we deal with. There were, uh, were 70 last year, and 20 of them were different than prior years. And the, the numbers, I went back uh, six, seven years, and the numbers are pretty constant on, on the business. And um, again, uh, most of it coming from uh, uh, 10, 
10 vendors, but that, that 10 will rotate but two or three every year, our top 10 vendors. And most of our uh, vendors, our big vendors, are small companies. So we tend to be sourcing from small companies for large companies, plus the emerging technology area. Um, so I'd, I'd like to go into some of our actual projects and some of our uh, uh, stories. Uh, TMC was a little lab curiosity. We got requests for a few years. We were supplying it. It's, uh, it's an interesting monomer. It looks simple. It's, it's very difficult to manufacture. Uh, it, it has wide use, growing uses, uh, primarily in, uh, in uh, health field, in implants. It's used in polymerizations to um, make biosorbable polymer sutures that don't have to be removed. The body will absorb. It also has some industrial applications. So it's, you know, it's a very useful monomer. And uh, now we are really the only commercial source of high purity material for uh, these critical applications. So we were, uh, uh, after 26 years, sometimes you, you get lucky, and this is one of them that has worked out very well for us. And we're supporting a lot of applications on various uh, stages of the, of the product life cycle in, in various regulatory areas. And we're, we're manufacturing substantial quantities. We have some commercial applications, so uh, this is going very nicely. Uh, an, another project, this was uh, one of the projects, I was fortunate enough to be the project manager on this, usually because nobody else wants it or thinks it's a waste of time. But um, I had a, a client come in, they had purchased some technology from uh, a large company. It was an antiviral material and a very, very good antiviral, a very simple common molecule, but the, 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 uh, the inventing company had developed it. They had made one production batch. They'd done a lot of tests, and they had abandoned it. And, and this company bought the rights, and they had done a lot of testing, and it, was, it would uh, kill on contact almost all viruses, HIV, swine, H1N1, and it had a durability. It was, it was good for eight hours. So hospitals, uh, hands, uh, cruise ships, they wipe every 30 minutes with alcohol-based things, which only kill until they evaporate. And there was a, a lot of problems. They came, they came to me when, uh, uh, I think it was just before, we, did, we had done a little work, they were trying to market it, uh, their problem was it was never EPA registered, it was never FDA registered. So it, it had applications for uh, hand sanitizers or drugs. And there's like 12 actives that are grandfathered. This one is better than anything on the market, but it would require full FDA drug thing. And a small company wasn't going to do that. They were hoping a customer would or whatever. And even EPA registration is millions of dollars for the tox test. So this is just a, a problem. So so they came up with this Middle Eastern billion dollar, trillion dollar sovereign wealth fund that was interested in this. And it was all of a sudden, after a couple years, they were, you know, it was, it was fast-tracked. And this was just the 09 swine flu epidemic. Uh, the client wanted 13 million hand sanitizer units. We had been working with, uh, well, the, the Middle Eastern, uh, the ultimate customer. We had been working uh, with a manufacturer to do some small quantities for testing anyway. Uh, the, the active is, is very powerful and it's actually, you know, by the time it's formulated, it's like one or one percent of it. So 13 million hand sanitizers is not that much active actually and we could make it in 
thousand gallon or two thousand gallon equipment and make the market but then the client says i need somebody to package it i need somebody to formulate it and everything and i said whoa, whoa. <laughs> this is big so we start buying you know these uh, hand sanitizer spray things of course they're all in short supply because everybody wants them um, and there are also problems that it's not FDA registered. You can manufacture the bulk in the U.S. for export to a country that approves it, but you can't form, you can't uh, do dose form packaging is the rule. So we were all set to package, formulate, uh, uh, synthesize, formulate, and then I found a place in Europe. I booked time. So we... Uh, the, the next step was to bring them to the manufacturing step, and there were a whole bunch. I had all my people, my customers, three or four people, but the client was sending people, and we're going to Wisconsin, a small town in Wisconsin, and, you know, the manufacturer calls me, and he says, where do we take them for lunch? Because they're, you know, obviously going to be Muslims. And what do we, you know, do I need to put foot baths out or something? So I call my client. He said, oh, no, they're cool. They're any place. And I said, you know, the closest place is ribs and beer to like, no. He said, it's fine, really. It's, it's okay. So there we go. We have the plant tour. Everything's good. Uh, we go to the lunch place, and they're cool. I mean, uh, some of them order salads. And in fact, the, uh, the, the vegetarian, turns out, is, is Indian. He's Hindu, and he's a retired tennis pro. And they all went to London School of Economics. I mean, they're all smart and everything and worldly. But it was like, you know, it was a really interesting crew. It's an interesting lunch. And then we finish lunch and we're walking out and on the TV at these places, there were no sports on, and Mexico City hijacking <laughs> is occurring live. It turned out it was ended early, but it was just occurring live. And I'm walking out with the two guys from, you know, the, the, the home country and they say to each other, is that one of ours? And I say, oh my God. <laughs> So it turned out it wasn't. It was locals, and you know we were still okay. Uh, the project continued. The fund transferred. The deal was they were going to invest ten million dollars in the company and give us the order for the thirteen million. They the company was based in Florida. They wire transfer ten million dollars to my client's bank, and in Florida there's some issue with ten million dollars coming into banks. <laughs> I, I don't really know anything about that, but uh, by the time the Treasury got involved, the, uh, the country in the Middle East pulled the stuff. The money was bouncing back and forth from the Bahamas to whatever for months. So we, we, never, we, we never sanitized the Hajj is the end of it. Uh, on a totally different side is one of the larger companies uh, came to us early on. They had, a, they had a polymer coating that was a key to drug eluding stents a few years back. It was the biggest thing in, in cardio, uh, cardiology care. And they, had, they were a device company. They had no chemistry. They were, literally, it was paper chemistry. Uh, they were fortunate they came to us it was uh, uh, highly leveraged. I mean, we were making an important product, a high value product, but the product they were selling with this, and this was the key ingredient because it controlled the, the drug elution key, it was billions of dollars of product from ours. So the, the, the regulatory, uh, the controls, it was very intense. Our manufacturer was also a billion dollar company. So we had all these people bouncing around. There were trailers full of them at the manufacturing site. There are all kinds of disagreements. And we're, uh, first of all, we, we had to commercialize this through development, get it to work. Um, and we did it domestically, even though it wasn't obvious where you were gonna find it. Uh, it was successful. Uh, we managed commercial production for uh, four years. Um, 
I got involved a little too heavily after uh, early on the product transferred from the development arm of the company to the manufacturing arm. And it was even worse that the manufacturing arm had been an acquisition and it was a totally different culture. The development, they didn't like the development people, the development people didn't like them. The manu development people loved us, the manufacturing people thought we were just robbing them. And uh, so, and uh, both companies had a tradition of all in-house counsels, so they had their lawyers handling everything. I don't have a tradition of in-house counsel. My, my counsel's uh, back there at table three. And, at the, and you know, I, because she's here, I won't, I won't quote her rate, but it was something that we didn't want to have her in the room with these two guys <laughs> for too long. So I was, I was coached. Um, I signed up for a short course, actually, on, uh, on what to do to protect our interest, and we did. We negotiated, and we were able to protect our interest. I, I remember the, uh, the client's lawyer saying, um, this is a, what is it, you know, whatever, a $7 billion business for us, and Richmond is not going to shut us down. <laughs> and I agreed with him because that was ab ab obviously true. But we stayed with the project. They even paid us for stuff that we didn't make for whatever reason. They just kept sending us checks. Apparently, my course was effective because they, they overpaid us, and I didn't have to uh, do any more. So uh, one of the advantages of being a small company with where your relationships are your assets, not ground and steel, is that you can be flexible and you can evolve as the business changes. So uh, we've been evolving more and more towards uh, uh, startup companies, emerging technology, different types of chemistry, um, Processes at the extreme of normal process equipment. Uh, some of the interesting areas we get into is nanotechnology. There's, I'm, I'm amazed at how much chemistry there is in nanotechnology. Uh, displays, electronics. Um, we're also able to offer additional services, compliance, regulatory. We now have experience. We also have a... Uh, consultants we bring in as, as needed. And, and one of the other advantages of, that we have over a CRO or a CMO or a, a full-scale manufacturer is we can work all scales. We have different silos of R&D companies and uh, smaller to bigger. Although our style on a project is, if we can, we place the project where it's going to be commercial as soon as we can. If, if the commercial producer has some R&D capabilities, it's best to do it all in one place. And we've been able to differentiate ourselves is that, that again, we're uh, experienced in the, the uh, sounds like non-core areas, so it, it continues. And we, we've also added, uh, uh, surprisingly, law firms, I think it started with law firms approaching us and saying, we have a client that we're doing all this work and they really have no idea about manufacturing. Can we hire you to do an evaluation? And, uh, you know, we didn't say no and it's, it's become a nice business for us. There's, there's a big demand and there's really, uh, you know, there, there's nobody better at this than we are. We, we do this, we've been doing this for free for all our clients. So. You know, it's, it's a way to do it for other people, and maybe they'll develop into uh, uh, clients. We, uh, and, and we, again, have a generalist perspective. It's not just the manufacturing, it's the regulatory, it's, it's commercial aspects, it's where you're going to manufacture it. Um, and we, we're doing a lot of work with universities, uh, technology parks, incubators, uh, and it's been very successful. It, it feeds the, the early stage of our pipeline. And I mean, I, I don't buy green bananas, but I have an early stage pipeline. So, uh, 
So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you very much. Uh, eight people. Eight people. We're about 10 million in revenue. And again, we, we don't have any manufacturing uh, or whatever. We're, uh, when you look at our projects, we're thousands, but we don't pay their salaries. Wayne. Uh, not the way we do it. There's, uh, there are companies in the U.S. who manufacture in Asia, and they will have a portfolio of companies. And we actually use some of them when we want to source from uh, Asia. But uh, we're, we're primarily, about 80% of our business is done in, in North America because it's better for our clients. And we, we're not actually spending more money for the most part. In many cases, we save money. It's uh, China and, and India are not all what they seem. And we, we do business in both countries. But I, I don't think, uh, I'm not aware that people are doing the independent outsourcing approach to that. Ed, uh, wonderful story. I'm glad I'm here to listen to it. Looking to the future, what is your approach to su succession planning for the organization? <laughs> Don't buy green bananas. Yes. Um, yes, well, that's, uh, uh, that's still in the future. Um, uh, as, as, long as, uh, we're, as long as we're still taking care of uh, of family parents, we figure I, I've got to work, and I've got to work till my kids go on social security at least. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Good talk. Uh, you have a competitor out there you probably didn't have in the early days of your business called Google, and I wondered uh, what is to prevent your potential customers from just bypassing you and finding out the sources that they need without having to, to pay the middleman. Uh, yeah, there, there's a word for, I found out years ago, there's a word for putting people like me out of business called disintermediation. And when they have a word for putting you out of business, you have to be careful. Uh, Google, and we were, we've been cautious about a lot of things like that. Google is, is better for us than it is worse. I mean, we get more business because of Google, and I, I don't know that we lose any. So we use Google frequently to search for things. It's amazing how people don't do it themselves. And even if they do, uh, they're not going to be successful if they don't have the record in the industry. So if, if I can generalize and say, on one end, you'll have Merck Pfizer, and they don't have to Google because they, they've got 100 or 200 companies in their base, and they'll go to them. On the other hand, you'll have these small startups, and they'll Google, and they'll come up with DuPont and Dow, and they'll get nowhere. So it, it is still an opaque market. And even if the vendors become visible, they won't know how to talk to them. They will never get the project done. We, we get people who will essentially say, oh, you don't own the equipment, and they you know, won't listen to our value added. And then they call back six months later, and they're in a real hurry. And I mean, this happens all the time. So it's, it's not like buying a pair of golf shoes from a catalog, where you size and whatever, and you buy them. It's, it's still buying a service that is, has a lot of parameters. And it, where we are helped by all these technology things. Of course, we adapt them right away. We say, oh, this is important. And the other companies, it's not their primary concern. So they just try it. You know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, when you want to do something in another area, you hire a pro with experience in that area. 
Uh, yes, excellent talk. I really, really appreciated it. Thank you. Quick, two quick questions. Number one, do you typically get involved in the negotiation process between your clients and manufacturers, even on an advisory basis? That's one question. And two, do you anticipate getting involved in this whole issue of biosimilars? Okay, on, on the first, we have, we start out with separate negotiations with vendors and clients. And we get a project like the stents. We get, it, it evolves into a three-party management contract, a manufacturing contract. But, but we're buying the service. So for the customer, we're the supplier. We give him access to the manufacturing site so that all the technology and everything he has to interact. And it's the mirror image for the manufacturer. We give him, we're his customer, we give him access that, uh, you know, to our customer for technical issues. And really, the manufacturers love this because it's less work and headaches for them. And we have, with manufacturers we worked with, they know what we're delivering and how we're project managing. Some customers, they're curious, but really, with the emerging tech area, that's, it, it's terrific for them. Uh, the second area, biosimilars, uh, we, we don't do that much with large molecules. We've done a couple things where there have been situations, the, uh, the large, the biologicals, you're, you know, they're proteins or whatever for people here, as opposed to the conventional pharmaceutical, which are large, but, you know, three or four hundred molecular weight instead of thousands. And, um, there, it's, it's a transparent market. It's, it's like, you know, tens or hundreds of millions to build these plants, and the people know who they are. And uh, so, uh, as opposed to like generic uh, small molecule pharma, which we may get involved with, we don't anticipate uh, being involved in the biosimilars. Uh Perhaps you answered this in the first part of that last answer. Uh, it wasn't clear you were talking about the TMC monomer. Yes. Uh, you, you were saying that we manufactured it. There were so many projects flying back and forth that it wasn't clear to me as to whether you personally, your company. Well, right. When, when I say we manufacture, it's like we have a manufacturer. We don't own the equipment, but we feel like, and TMC is our product. I mean, that happens to be an exclusive. So uh, we're doing everything except the OSHA inspections at the plant and pl paying the operators. So it's just, you know, like in a bigger company, they have their headquarters in one state and their manufacturing plant in another state. And you speak to the, the people at the headquarters, they'll say, we manufacture, but you don't find them on the floor. So I'm, I'm taking an ownership position in it when I say we manufacture, but we, we never own the facilities. Actually, sometimes we own the equipment because sometimes we need to buy the equipment to start the project. So, so that's the context I'm using. So, so you were outsourcing, literally. Well, <laughs> we're using a, a manufacturing project. facility we don't own, yes. Maybe answer, ask that question a little bit differently. In the event the, the compound of interest is patented or a process to make it is patented, who owns the patents? The uh, Richmond Chemical or does the manufacturer? Uh, our, our client, your client okay. the customer. Almost always it's the customer in this business. Okay. Yeah, Tom. Thank, thank you, Tom. All project management always has issues. Are, are there more issues on the client side or the customer side or on the manufacturing side? as time goes on in every project, or are they all, each one is unique also, I realize. Well, they, the, the projects are fun because they certainly are unique. And what well, team, who, who votes for client problems most? Uh, there are uh, manufacturers, sometimes there's mistakes or incidents, but again, if we follow the advice, quality pays for itself, we try to, you know, keep our manufacturers upgraded. But yeah, usually the problems are generated by the customer. The only problem we have with manufacturers is if the, if the customer calls them and says, we want to buy direct. 
And, you know, 99 out of 100 times the manufacturer says, no, Richmond's our customer. And occasionally they will call us and say, we're not sure we want to manufacture because we don't like the, the values of your customer. But once every three years, a manufacturer, one of the bigger companies, or maybe the, the guy is not the guy we started with, they move people around, will say, you know, the customer says they want to do this, and the customer is always right. So then we refer to rule two. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's solving client problems, but manufacturers, uh, you know, all, everything we do, we do for the first time, the first time. So you run into problems, and it's working through the communication. So we, we don't view them so much as, as serious, you know, as problems that are going to kill, you have to work through them. But clients generate problems by giving you wrong uh, data, wrong processes, changing things. So it's, it, there is a lot of client management. And again, we feel our project management structure where the guys are handling both sides gives them uh, an ability to, to manage that. And I see the, the big beard has come for the little beard. <laughs> yeah, nice beard, huh? Thank you very much. This was terrific. Thank, thank you. Lee. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure this could have gone on and on, but you know we always. Yes, right. And CHF has a little token of appreciation. Thank you very Thanks, much. Ed. Thank you, Wayne. So long. I'll see you next month. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. I think it was very clear that you brought up the value. I thought it was very clear. Thank you. It's, it took us a few years to get the terms right. It was very clear.